Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. We're finally getting into the holiday spirit because this week on Thursday and Friday will be Christmas Eve and Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> and I can't wait to finally have this wonderful festive season. I mean, already, you know, with Hanukkah continuing and I think Festivus is joining in too and all. <laughs> and then Kwanzaa and everything. Well, I decided to um, review um, a holiday favorite, but this time it's going to be the sequels. Uh, now that I picked up um, the Blu-ray set of the free movie collection, because I had a gift card uh, for Target, and what well, do you know, it's, it's the Santa Claus movies from Disney. Yes, the movie that made Tim Allen a rising star starting his movie career after his successful comedy sitcom, Home Improvement. Yes. Now, I did review the first movie, which is a classic on its own, where it actually shifts tones. It's a family-friendly film, uh, mixed in with adult-oriented. I mean, that's why you have Tim Allen throwing in all the, the wise-cracking jokes and everything that's in there. Some jokes that that even kids wouldn't get. But whatever the case, it really works. And it's joined by their sequels after their success with the first movie. In the 2000s, we had The Santa Claus 2, where this time um, Scott Calvin, who's played by Tim Allen, now Santa Claus, he was just joined in to find a Mrs. Claus. And then we have the third movie, which is called The Escape Clause, which this time he battles with uh, the evil scene-stealing and wisecracking uh, Martin Short. He's always playing all these uh, weird characters and all, but he's always been a delight playing Jack Frost. Yeah. <laughs> um, of course, it won't top the first movie, but you get the idea. Um, it has all the features. The first movie is basically um, the special edition released from 2002. So all those features are ported. Uh, a few of the DVD-ROM features are not included, but whatever. But therefore, I do wish that they did port it some more features that they should have had. Like, they could have had deleted scenes. If you look at the later trailers uh, for the first movie, there was other scenes that could have been included. I feel like they really were missing that. Um, they could have also had the original teaser trailer, the theatrical trailers, maybe some TV spots, and maybe all these other behind the scene featurettes that they should have included to make the set better. I mean, especially for the Blu-ray. And the transfer of the Blu-ray is uh, surprisingly solid uh, considering the fact that this movie was made in 1994. Um, and that that's how I really miss nowadays when movies were actually looking more, you know, warmth and definitely uh, soft looking in a way, which is not bad. And it gives it a, a grittiness and a darkness and chills, that, that kind of filmmaking. And, and you kind of miss the practical effects that they had. But they blend in with some CGI effects, um, not too much. But it just felt like a, a perfect, heartwarming uh, family film. But it has a shifted tone of adult-oriented, of having Tim Allen, you know, cracking up some uh, jokes that even some kids wouldn't get. <laughs> That's what I love about that. Um, in fact, I know there was one scene that sadly has been cut on the Blu-ray release, but surprisingly enough, uh, it was retained on the digital copy from Voodoo, uh, where it's the 1-800-SPANK-ME line, yeah, which, which unfortunately was cut due to the fact that uh, one of the kids actually called that number and that turned out to be a phone sex hotline. That got into bigger trouble. Yeah, censorship takes over for Disney. Can't protect stupid these days. Uh, what can you do? I'm going to review the sequels, though. The sequels, on the other hand, has all the features, 
plenty of them compared to the first movie, and I just wish that that was the case here. Anyway, going back to the first one, it had, uh, so you want to be an elf featurette. Uh, yes, would you have uh, Bernard the Elf, played by David Krumholtz, uh, explaining of all the EPK on how they did the movie, which is nice, but it's pretty short. It has the Making Santa Snacks with Wolfgang Puck. Yeah, he's a very famous uh, chef. You know, they were making pizza, Christmas cookies, and all these other kinds of snacks. And then there's the Night Before Christmas shorts. The very uh, famous short uh, from Walt Disney Silly Symphonies, 1943, based on the original poem where you see Santa Claus, you know, just already uh, delivering all the toys to all the children who are already in bed during Christmas Eve. And you see all these toys doing all the work, you know, setting up the Christmas tree. A very nice short film, I mean, which actually appeared on, on The Wonderful World of Disney, among others. Yeah. So it's cool to have this on the Blu-ray, which is also on the DVD, too. So Santa Claus 2 have uh, deleted scenes, so it has some nice uh, scenes joining in. you got a commentary by director Michael Lembeck, who took over for John Pasquin, you know, who directed several episodes of Home Improvement, among other shows. And... As he is mentor for Tim Allen. Uh, you got bloopers from the cast, you know, showing, yeah, which is the gag reel. These a lot of gags going in. The Inside the North Pole with Curtis, yeah, Spencer Breslin playing Curtis the Elf, the assistant for Bernard, which I know he'll take over for the third movie. The Escape Clause, this Santa Claus 3, has the blooper reel, the alternate opening. Yeah, that's where we get to see a uh, cameo appearance by Abigail Breslin, yeah, the sister of Spencer, who's already becoming popular now. The, the Crating Movie Magic, which shows the visual effects sequence behind the film. Yeah, they show the new comedians on set, of course, Tim Allen and, and Martin Short, or Marty. <laughs> Jack Frost and Mrs. Claus, a very different look. Yeah, that's why they're giving a, a special look to them to make it look better than ever. And once again, audio commentary by Michael Lembeck. So, got it all right here. Um, yeah, the slipcover, I mean, this is brand new, by the way. Uh, that's why you notice the, the Disney Movie Insiders. So you use the code for Movies Anywhere. So here, this is from the 2019 release. It has all the Christmas lights all around, and yeah, it's still using the cover of, of Santa Claus, you know, Scott Calvin, played by Tim Allen. That's for the third movie. Yeah. Yeah, of course, the first movie only being PG rated, while the sequels are, are G rated. <laughs> okay, uh, it's hard to get that out. Um, yes, this is what it looks like. Um, the the third disc is um, that's all stacked up together with the the second movie, so I'm I'm just gonna leave it that way. So why not? And this is just the digital codes. So I already used it, um, which thankfully it might include the uh, the original cut, um, but it won't be on the movies anywhere. Uh, it's gonna be on the Voodoo one. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, that's a nice set right here. <laughs> so, now I'm going to be reviewing their sequels, starting with The Santa Claus 2 from 2002. Now, originally, though, it was going to be called The Santa Claus 2 Escape Clause, which eventually would be the third film. Uh, if you look back at the original teaser trailer for the second movie, it was actually, believe it or not, the original teaser trailer for the first movie, but they just uh, recycled it, so you could tell that Tim Allen looked quite younger at the time, <laughs> where you know he was holding the snow globe, and then he accidentally dropped it, <laughs> and it was it, they even shot this uh, tilted too, so we begin to see the story of how you know Santa Claus. Uh, just fell off the roof, uh, he dies and he disappears, and suddenly Scott Calvin takes over for Santa. I mean, you know the story. Uh, where he's already divorced, 
He works at a toy corporation, you know, with his boss, uh, played by Peter Boyle, God rest his soul. And um, apparently during Christmas Eve, while um, his ex-wife, who's now married to uh, a shrink, yeah, Neil, his ex-wife, of course, is Laura, and they're both played by you know, Judge Ryan Hall and, and Wendy Crewson. Um, it leads to a lot of family conflicts. I mean, Charlie eventually just couldn't handle dealing with the divorce that's going around and, and the fact that, that he's dealing with uh, her new husband and now fodder. His first fodder, of course. I mean, he was at first just having some tough times, but he was already feeling very lonely, very depressed because a you know, kid at school made fun of him. Yeah, that, that sort of thing. But therefore, you know, the the their dinner, you know, where he burns the turkey, you know, things were not working out. So they have to go to Denny's, and then next thing you know, um, just getting ready for to bed for Christmas Eve, they found out Santa was on top of the roof, and we know how that goes. And then Scott takes over. They found the reindeers and the Santa sleigh on the roof, and then they continue to go on. <laughs> and you know how that is. They went to the no the North Pole. Um, that's where we meet all the elves, including Bernard. And that's where we begin to find out the whole story. Where now he's going to become the new Santa. Yeah, because the claws that he discovered from the the calling card here. And <laughs> and that's and then the following the year he now starts to become Santa. You know he's starting to gain weight. You know he. His gray, his hair is now turning gray and white. So now he's becoming a jolly old man, as we know it. And he had to deliver all the gifts to everyone. And yes, and you know how the whole story went. Okay, <laughs> I know I'm talking a little more here. But this time, in this sequel, though, uh, Scott Calvin is now on the search to find a Mrs. Claus because if he doesn't. He'll be able to transform back to his normal self, and that's going to be the the case here. So anyway, um, I enjoyed this movie uh, at the time when I saw it. I mean, it is quite different from the first movie because this time it's G-rated, as I mentioned, and the special effects. I mean, this is 2000, by the way. I mean, things seems to change compared to the effects in, in the. 1994 film, it's starting to feel more like a family-friendly uh, film than rather than being an adult-oriented. I mean, it, it was all toned down a bit. Um, they still have all these slapsticks that they run into it. Yeah, there's a little bit of slapstick in the first one, but there's like plenty of that in the sequel. Uh, the effects looks more pasty this time. It looks incredibly vibrant. Uh, incredibly vibrant and vivid and and it's like all over the place and yeah it got pretty silly too I mean there's a lot of farting you know bathroom humor jokes and stuff like that and the wing, the reindeers I mean Comet seems to talk very uh, funny compared to the first movie and then then there's like a, a reindeer named Jet who had trouble controlling I mean this was a baby one. <laughs> yeah, Chet. I, I thought it was pronounced Jet, but yeah, it's called Chet. And this time they even got the uh, the legendary figures, you know, the holiday guardians like Mother, Mother Nature, Father Time, Cupid, the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, and even the Sandman. That's really a clever idea. Yeah. Anyway, but we're, we're going to get to that. Um, so it all, let's start the review because I'm really, you know, getting into the mood here. Stars Tim Allen, Eric Lloyd, Wendy Crewson, Judge Reinhold, Elizabeth Mitchell, which you may remember her from the TV series Lost. Yeah, this is definitely um, her rising star right here. But I think she was in other stuff too besides um, Lost. Uh, she was actually in the TV show V, the, the later series. Um, from 2009 
and Revolution, Dead of Summer. So yes, Elizabeth Mitchell. Uh, David Krumholtz, uh, Spencer Breslin, as you may remember him from the movie The Kid, yeah, the Bruce Willis film. Yeah, where he plays the inner child of himself. And of course he's the older brother of Abigail Breslin. Lillian Mummy, uh, which I know she later went on to do the Cheaper by the Dozen movies. Yeah, which I didn't care for. Awful films. Yeah, the ones with Steve Martin and Bonnie Hunt. I love the original better. Danielle Woodman, Isha Tyler, yeah, the comedian, who um, also is an actress. She also direct, she also directs some movies or shows or something, and she's also a talk show host too. Yeah, she's um, a very attractive uh, woman too, <laughs> but she's very funny. Um, Peter Boyle, who was in the first movie. I know she. I know he was in the movie uh, Young Frankenstein, and he was also in the TV show Everybody Loves Raymond. He's no longer with us, though, sadly. I mean, he passed away in 2006 due to cancer. Uh, Jay Thomas, uh, another great comedian. He was actually in the TV show Mork and Mindy. He too passed away a few years ago. Uh, Kevin Pollock. You may remember him from movies like Ricochet. Another You, um, The Whole Nine Yards, among other films. Uh, he's a great actor. He's also a funny comedian, too. Uh, Art LaFleu, you may remember him from The Sandlot, who plays um, Bay Roof. He was also in the movie uh, Cobra, you know, who plays uh, one of the cops, or I think he was a lieutenant, um, among others. Uh, Michael Dorn. Yes, Michael Dorn, uh, best known for playing the Lieutenant Wolf in the TV show Star Trek The Next Generation. Yeah, he's quite different compared to his um, makeup that he had uh, when he played the part. Uh, Molly Shannon, yes, you may remember her from um, Saturday Night Live, you know, the comedian. So, I love Molly Shannon. She's, she's very quirky, very funny at times. She's sweet. Uh, Bob Bergen, longtime voice actor, who's been doing the voice of Porky Pig, among others. And Kev uh, Susi, yes, best known for doing the voice of Phil and Lil on Rugrats. And she also did the voice of Sneezer, the mouse, from the TV show Tiny to the Ventures, among others. Uh, it's written by five writers, I can't believe it. Don Reimer, uh, Sino Paul, Ken uh, Dario, Ed Decker, and John G. Swouts. And it's directed by Michael Lembeck, who's an actor, and he has done some many appearances of shows, but he also went on to direct some TV shows and, and movies, too. So, he's a great guy. The movie began set eight years later. Uh, Scott Calvin was played by Tim Allen has already had became the greatest uh, Santa Claus we ever have at the North Pole. You know, already delivering gifts for all the children and adults out there. Exactly what they want. That is until the head elf, the leader of all the elves, uh, Bernard, played by David Krumholtz, who is now joined by his new assistant, Curtis, who is played by Spencer Breslin, by showing him the Keeper of the Handbook of Christmas to inform him that there's actually another clause. And that turns out to be the Mrs. Claus, who of course will soon be played by uh, Elizabeth Mitchell, who happens to be the principal named uh, Carol uh, Newman. And before we get to that, Scott is now being pressed to get married before the next Christmas Eve, or the clause will be broken, and he'll stop being Santa forever. At the same time, Abby the Elf had delivered an even more distressing news. And yes, um, she takes over for Judy, who was of course played by Paige Tanata. Now, this time, uh, 
She's played by Daniel uh, Woodman. But we found out that now Scott's son Charlie, who's played by Eric Lloyd, who's now a teenager, a very juvenile teenager, is on the naughty list. So now Scott must return to his home to search for a wife and set things right with Charlie. So he brings up when he visited the, the Council of Legendary Figures. Yeah, that's where we got Mother Nature, played by Isha Tyler, Fodder Time, played by Peter Boyle, Cupid, played by Kevin Pollock, The Easter Bunny, played by Jay Thomas, The Two Fairy, played by Art Lafleur. And the Sandman, played by Michael Dorn. So to cover um, his prolonged absence, uh, both Curtis and Bernard find a plan to actually create doppelganger of Santa. And it happens to be a toy Santa version of himself. So that way, you know, he'll be able to take over the job, which I know is going to lead to bigger problems. So, cloning himself. But much to Bernard's horror, after his request, Bernard reluctantly plays along and tells the other elves that Santa has a new makeover, so they won't question who he really is. And because of the appendance ends of his contract, Scott undergoes a desantification process that eventually turns him back into his normal self. And that's how it happened. But with only a limited amount of magic to help him. I mean, he's also wearing his watch just to find out how the process is going to change. Scott returns home to his ex-wife Laura, you know, played by Wendy Crewson, along with her husband Neil, you know, the shrink, played by Judge Reinhold. And this time, um, we learn that Charlie now has a sister. Yeah, they have a new daughter named Lucy. It was played by Lillian Mumphy. Charlie was hanging around with his friends, you know, spudding out some graffiti around the entire halls of school, through the gym, the, the locker rooms, and everything around, only to be caught by his principal, you know, Carol. The main reason why is because, well, we learned the secret behind Charlie was that he doesn't always get a chance to see uh, his father again, and another problem is is that since he's the only one who still believes in him, it's also because Carol was pretty much a non-believer, and just like how his uh, mother and father were, well, Neil, of course, um, because we know the story about what happened in the first movie. They didn't receive the mystery date game nor the, the Oscar Mayer weenie whistle until they finally did after all these years and Charlie had a soccer ball <laughs> okay because yeah he still has the snow globe that he remembers Scott realized that um, they're trying to give the school the attention to know that yes Scott is Santa Claus but they probably won't believe that and he and Charlie had to face Carol by uh, trying to set things right, you know, cleaning all the mess that they had made, you know, try to paint all that graffiti that he did with his friends. So at the note poll, uh, Toy Santa follows the rule book too literally and begins to think that everyone in the world is naughty. And because of the small mistakes, it seems to me like now he's under control, bringing in all the toy soldiers, and decided to send a whole bunch of kids a lump of coals. So this is going to become one heck of a nightmare for all the children out there. And that's when Bernard exposed this toy Santa that he's a fraud and they place him under arrest and they just continue to go on, you know, marching, ha hiring all the elves to, to send out all the coals out there. So after a few failed dates um, that Scott was joining in, and including the, well, if you saw the deleted scene, yeah, you'll see that he went out on the dinner date with, uh, with all the other ladies around. 
But we did met uh, Tracy, who's played by Molly Shannon, who, of course, um, just made an appearance. Uh, she's dressed up um, wearing the the Santa sweater and and decorated all the the gifts and for all of her bla bracelets. And then she eventually, uh, we learned that she's basically a songwriter to herself, working at a uh, at a recording studio, or the yeah the music industry. So at that point on, she was she was uh, doing <laughs> basically her impression of Shania Train. She's very uh, she loves uh, Shania Train, and that's her favorite. And decided to do like a a Christmas version of of that Shania Train song. Man, I feel like a woman. Well, it causes a scene at the restaurant. Everyone was like staring at her, but he thought that it, it sounded pretty scary, kind of scared me a little bit, and then that's where she broke up with him. Didn't work out. So at that point on, Scott eventually finds himself falling in love with Carol. So he accompanies her in a horse drawn sleigh to the faculty of the Christmas party. It was a very nice scene too. I mean, it even started snowing, and they're just uh, making all these conversations, you know, just to get to know each other. And then this is where we begin to see the whole uh, secret Santa idea was when she confesses that she used to believe in Santa as a child until she was forced to stop doing so. So her parents started fighting with children to tell her that Santa wasn't real, and that was the main reason. So once they went to the Christmas party, I mean, this is where it begins a special presentation that, yes, he has the last remaining of, of the magic left and decided to actually send out all the presents just to cheer everyone up because the party just seems pretty dull. So now uh, Scott is like sending all the presents to all the adults around, you know, all the, uh, the faculty um you know, school staffs around, and and they were all excited because they actually remember all the toys that they they were going to give uh, when when they were kids, and they remember all this stuff, and they, and they were excited. They were also playing the toys, and you know, they're just having a wonderful time. And then Scott eventually gives uh, Carol a gift, which turned out to be a baby doll, and she was like, she was very surprised. <laughs> Uh, all this time until Scott reveals the truth the unbelievable truth which I'm not the biggest fan of that cliche and that's where Carol was very shocked to find out who he really is and that's where you know she felt a little furious and uh, very shocked and surprised and decided to have uh, Scott leave. Well, that also led to another conflict too. Was when already uh, you know, Charlie, along with his friends, were just going around throwing snowballs at her house, and this is where she, he realized that yes, Scott was falling in love with Carol, and this is where it became a problem. Like he he did this behind his back. Like he thought he was going to be on his side. You know, if he wasn't going to get into trouble, like he was, wasn't going to get, you know, suspended from school or getting punished or anything like that. And just to have to do all the community service, you know, clean all the mess that he made with all the graffiti. <sighs> anyway, therefore, um, Charlie confessed to Scott how hard it is hard for him that Scott is never around like other fathers and then reveals the pressure that he's under to conceal the secret that his father is Santa. So Lucy managed to convince Charlie not to be mad at him, which leads Charlie to convince Carol that Scott is Santa by showing the, her his uh, snow globe and this is where she begins to find out uh, herself. So Curtis flies to in the, so Curtis flies in to tell um, Scott about the toys Santa's plan. So they had to join in with the Tooth Fairy, um, 
hoping that they'll find a plan to actually, well, this was what led to the slapstick here, to pull out a tooth, which turned out to be, well, at first they were going to do it for Scott, but then apparently uh, <laughs> Lucy decided to actually do it herself. Yeah, she realized her tooth fell off, and so now they, they form a plan to actually stop the toy Santa, along with the, the toy soldiers. It's going to lead to a battle between the, all of them. So now um, Scott joining in with Carol, along with the two fairy, as well as Charlie and uh, Curtis, to go rushing by to the North Pole to stop them. And this is what leads to, to the scene where Scott is now joining in with Chet. <laughs> yeah, who's going around just you know, flying around, having trouble, you know, <laughs> stopping. Uh, we already noticed uh, they're also joined in by Comet, too, who just had to eat all of the uh, the chocolates, all the candy around. Yeah, he, he gained so much weight. Uh, yeah, I also forgot that, yes, uh, he was actually joined by uh, Comet. Uh, just to take care. So now they're they're about to rush to to stop uh, the toy Santa who's from taking over and and sending all the coals. And then this is where we lead to the fights. You know, Scott finally stop him, and now he won. You know, and and then everything went back to the way they were. So now, uh, both Scott and Carol have finally got married. You know, joining in with Mother Nature as as the the priest, and that's how they made a kiss. And now um, Scott is finally back to his Santa Claus self, and then everything just went back to normal. <laughs> yeah, and Carol is now becoming Mrs. Claus, and he's already gaining weight. Yeah, uh, if you go to the uh, the credit scenes, I mean, yes, you'll be able to see her dancing around. She's gaining weight. Now you know she's going to be what she is. Yeah, it's just wonderful. Um, it really is an enjoyable sequel. I mean, I really didn't mind this one. It's actually decent. Uh, it's heartwarming at its right place. Uh, they really brought it in all together. It's like a whole different movie compared to the first movie. But I know it couldn't top the first one, and rightly so, because the way the film's tone turned out to be, it's felt more like just an actual you know, Christmas movie than just your regular types of uh, other holiday films that we had you know, during the, the time period. Um, but it was great to see Tim Allen reprising the role as Scott Calvin, you know, Santa Claus himself, and then just to see how things are going on. It was nice to see David Crumholtz reprising his role as Bernard, and he's always fun to watch. And he had plenty of screen time, too, um, compared to the screen time he had in the first one. And I always love his wisecracking and his toughness and all. Now, Spencer Breslin, who plays Curtis, I mean, he was okay, but he's kind of annoying. And I think that was a mistake to actually have him be the assistant because now he, I know he's going to take over being number one instead of number two. Yeah, now I can see how that's going to turn out in the third movie. Because if you saw the special features, you'll know what I'm talking about. Like he couldn't get along with Bernard. I'm sorry, but I'll take Bernard over Curtis. That, that was the mistake. I mean, I'd rather have Judy instead. Yeah, Julie, uh, Julie. I mean, she's she's cute. I mean, she's she gets to make Coco trying to get the recipe right for like like over like a thousands of years, maybe even more. I mean, she's way better. She's more smarter too. I know. They had to go there. Uh, but Abby's not so bad. I mean, sort of a replacement of her, but she could have been close. Um, it was also nice to see Eric Lloyd, um, even though I didn't kind of like the change that they really went into him. I mean, even though this is the same Charlie that we all know, already 
but now as a teenager, it just seems like he's so juvenile, the way he acts, and his friends is just, you know, your typical friends, you know, they're getting into bigger trouble, you know, with all the graffiti and everything, it just doesn't work, that was a, that was my uh, issue here. Uh, Elizabeth Mitchell, wonderful presence uh, as uh, Carol Newman, she's also the best thing about the movie too, and um, I love her. She's a great actress, and her portrayal is definitely perfect. I mean, I love the scene where she actually goes by to this high school student. She gives her the eye contact in a whole different way where she says, Look into my eyes. What do you see? Your whole future self. Like she was about to psych him out. I thought that was really clever. They did actually do that in the deleted scene where he did that to the toy soldiers, which led to that war that happened. I thought, yeah, that could have been kept. I love that. And, of course, the scene with the, the toy soldiers is where it sort of felt like just a, a rip-off of the scene. And, yeah, it's sort of like a parody of of uh, Braveheart. Like if uh, Scott Calvin was basically <laughs> uh, William. <sighs> yeah, they were going for that, too. Um, and it was nice to see Wendy Crewson and... Judge Reinhold back again, um, even though they look quite different than they were in the first movie. You, know, you can really tell that you know, the appearance have changed. I mean, they were getting a little older, um, given the screen time that they were having. Um, it has some nice cinematography done by Adam Greenberg. I mean, he's been a longtime cinematographer for many films, including the James Cameron films and and several films with Arnold Schwarzenegger, so this was perfect. Yeah, he's now retired, though. But I, I love the way he did it. Uh, the music, of course, was done by George S. Clinton. Uh, yes, interesting enough, I mean, this is the same man who sang all these other songs, like Atomic Dog. So he, he did compose it very well, too, just to give it a more magical touch. Um, the special effects in the movie, yes, it's all done in CGI. There's a blend in of practical effects. You know, they did use all the sets of what the North Pole looks like with the Santa's workshop and the elves town that they got. Yeah, Elfberg. You get to see everything on there. That was uh, pretty amazing how they did it. I mean, compared to the first movie for that particular budget, you only get to see it underground. And it's supposed to be underground, too, the way they shot that. Um, so it looks even better than ever. Um, but it still has the touch of what the 1984 film was like, too. <laughs> so I'm just getting going back and forth to it. Um, so, yes, the effects is basically, you know, 2000s effects. Um, the special makeup effects were all done by Alex Gillis and Tom Warfob Jr., yeah, best known for working together with the effects in the Alien films um, and other movies, too. They've been a long-time companion for all the uh, special effects and makeups. and So they're perfectly well-designed the way they did it. I mean, how they created you know, Santa Claus for Scott Calvin, and, uh, as well as the Mrs. Claus uh, in the later scenes, and, or any of the other magical touches here, the makeup. On the elves too, with the the, the uh, glitters and all, and how they did them, it's just perfect. So yeah, it doesn't look too bad. Lillian Mumpy as um, Lucy is not so bad either. Um, she's very cute. I mean, it's understandable because you know she's a little girl. Yeah, we're pretty much like that too as kids. You know, we too tend to go a little hyper. Like, I mean, there was a scene in the movie where she started questioning uh, Charlie while he was shoveling some snow. You know, trying to explain about uh, his problems. And he was just giving a lot of hard questions. Uh, but there was a nice moment, too, where he tells um, Lucy about how he remembers uh, his father as Santa. I mean, this was special. And this was a heartwarming scene, too. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, when the 
Scott arrives uh, through the fireplace. Now, I do have problems, of course. I mean, the toy Santa was sort of unnecessary. I know, they're just going for another villain uh, for Tim Allen to play. Like, this is his doppelganger, and didn't seem to work. I mean, they had some lame slapstick here and there, and all that, too. Uh, now, going back to the music, yeah, the soundtrack um, has a blend of other holiday songs. You know, you got Smokey Robinson and the Miracles singing Santa Claus is Coming to Town. You got Run Rudolph Run by Chuck Berry, which is cool. You heard that in Home Alone. Uh, Jingle Bells sung by Brian Sisler. And you even got the She Daisy um, song called Santa's Got a Brand New Bag. That's cool. And you got uh, Eddie Money and Ronnie Spector doing the song Everybody Loves Christmas. Yeah, Eddie Money, God Rest His Soul. And of course, Hilary Duff singing the song Santa Claus Lane. Oh boy, that was awful. I hated that, that song. I, I don't like Hilary Duff. Uh, there was a song called Unwritten Christmas by Unwritten Law and Sum 41, though. That was actually cool. <laughs> And then there's also Louis Armstrong's song, Is That You, Santa Claus? <laughs> so they're all included here. This was, of course, the highest grossing sequel. Um, it actually grossed uh, uh, $139.2 million out of its $65 million budget. You wouldn't believe it, because the first movie's budget was only at $22 million. So this was pretty huge for the, at the time, you know, $65 million. It would probably be the equivalent of maybe 200 actually like over 200 so this is a perfectly amazing budget for a film like this so so in a way I mean and for its writing I mean yeah it kinda of seemed a little cynical and it kinda of got silly at times and all that but other than that though it's not a bad sequel I mean it's it's worth watching and it's better than than what people think but now we're probably going to get to what the third film is going to turn out. I mean, once I get to that. <laughs> anyway. But that's the Santa Claus 2. And I give the movie four stars. Why not? I mean, it's it doesn't top the first movie, but it's pretty close. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.